Welcome everyone to our evening with Bishop Barron. I'm Leah Sargent. I work here at the Princeton at the Aquinas Institute for Catholic Life. I know we've got everyone kind of streaming in through Zoom. Uh, so I'm going to give you a moment to just all remember to click the link for the folks who aren't already here. Uh, but we're so pleased to have you here tonight. So the Aquinas Institute for Catholic Life at Princeton is the Catholic chaplaincy. We're a resource for Catholic students and we're a resource for any student at Princeton who's curious about Catholicism or has questions about the faith. Hmm. So without further ado, let me pass things off to Bishop Barron with one of the questions we received from a student. Bishop, what are the best ways to share the gospel with people who think they've already heard it? How can I bring Christ to friends who have had some exposure to Christianity, but have rejected it? Yeah, thanks for that question. And Leah, good to be with you. Thanks for having me uh, today for this event. You know, in some ways, I think we have to re-radicalize Christianity. Christianity has always been a, a radical movement. Here's what I mean. At the heart of it is the cross of Jesus Christ. So Paul says, you know, that my one theme is Christ and him crucified. Holding up the cross was central to the whole operation. Well, what does the cross mean? Well, here's a, a crucified criminal. Here's someone who was rejected by the power structure of his time. Talk about a, a marginalized, voiceless victim. Um, you think of the animal cry of Jesus on the cross in Mark's gospel before he dies, this sort of inarticulate cry. Well, there's so much passion today, especially among young people, for justice, to care for the marginalized, to hear the voice of the voiceless, to attend to the needs of the oppressed, etc. Well, right at the heart of Christianity is exactly that kind of figure, the crucified Jesus, done to death by the powers that, that were at the time. Now, keep telling the story. Jesus doesn't remain simply a victim of powerful forces, but rather through the power of the Holy Spirit is raised from the dead, which means that God's love is more powerful than anything that's in the world, more powerful than even these enormously powerful forces that did him in. Which is why I think holding up the cross of Jesus, don't think of it as just a little pious exercise. That's a taunt. It always has been. The very fact that Paul, who held up that cross so courageously, spent a lot of time in jail tells you exactly how the powers that be take in the message of the cross. You know, one of the earliest forms of what we call the kerygma, you know, the basic proclamation of the faith, is you killed him, God raised him. There's the taunting quality of the cross. And so I think those who have a passion for the, the poor and the oppressed, the marginalized, good, good. Welcome to Christianity, at the very heart of which is this crucified figure. But also, the declaration of the power of God, which is greater than anything that's in the world. That's the still radical message of the cross and the message of the kingdom of God. And so I think for those who, you know, they've heard it, oh yeah, ho-hum Christianity, I don't know if they've caught how radical this message really is. Thank you, Bishop. You know, I think the, the radicalism of Christ's witness is something we see so, so clearly in the witness of the early church, in people yeah. who knew that they were risking death um, and were proclaiming Christ's kingdom. But one student had a question about how we approach our lives as Christians with such a large space between us and the experience of the early apostles. So your next question from a student yeah. is, how do we emulate the lifestyle of Jesus and his followers in a time so technologically, socially, and culturally different than theirs? Hmm. Yeah, well, of course, the point is not to you know, go back to the uh, social uh, setting of the first century and live the way they did. It's to emulate Jesus is to live in love and compassion and mercy and nonviolence, radical trust in the divine providence, turning one's entire life over to the Lord. Those are all the ways that we still emulate him. That's what discipleship is all about. So I wouldn't worry so much about imitating the lifestyle of the first century. In our very technological age, here and now, follow those great uh, patterns of life that are laid out in the Sermon on the Mount. And of course, as Thomas Aquinas said, you want to see the Sermon on the Mount in action, look at the cross. 
Go through the eight Beatitudes. They're all exemplified in Christ crucified. So that's how you emulate them. That's how you follow them, is um, live according to the great pattern of the sermon and the pattern of the cross. And that remains as, as viable and as, uh, as I say, radical today as it was 2,000 years ago. Well, I think one of, the, one of the challenges students face when they're trying to figure out what that looks like, we live our lives in the shadow of the cross um, and through the triumph of Christ over death, freeing us from bondage to original sin. Mm -hmm. But when we go out to proclaim that gospel, you know, one student asked, how do you explain the fallenness of the world or show its fallenness to a non-Christian who has no notion of the fall? Many of our friends or classmates live a life where they don't understand why a savior would be necessary. So how do we yeah. start to bridge that gap? No, that's a good question because you're exactly right, the implication you're drawing. If, if we just have a minor set of problems that we could solve through, you know, psychological advance or through economic reform or through political revolution and so on, then we wouldn't need a savior. We'd need, you know, a teacher maybe. We need someone to uh, lead us, a bold political reformer. But at the heart of Christianity is the claim that Jesus is so much more than that. You know that the um, Advent hymn that we sing every year, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Well, that's the, that's the lament of someone who's held um, for ransom. It's someone held captive. That was common in the ancient world. If you were a traveler and you'd be uh, arrested and you'd, you'd be taken away and held for ransom. Well, that means you're helpless. You can't save yourself. What you're doing is you're crying out that you might be delivered. And that's at the heart of Christianity. There's something that's off in us that's so profound that we can't solve it ourselves. Now, I think, Leah, actually, our language of addiction and the 12-step language is very helpful here because, you know, what's basic to anyone that's gone through a 12-step program is, look, you can't save yourself. If you think you can, this thing is going to be a disaster. You have to admit, you know, your powerlessness. You have to turn your life over to a higher power. Well, that's very spiritually alert language, I think. Sin has always been recognized as a kind of addiction. It's not just like, this, you know, a couple minor problems I have. I just got to spruce things up around the edges. No, no, sin, capital S, that we all have in us is a kind of fundamental dysfunction. And, and I think we feel it whenever we sense that we're at war with ourselves. Look at, at Romans chapter 7 now, you know. Paul says, that the good that I would do, uh-huh, that's what I don't do. <laughs> the evil that I would avoid, uh-huh. Th that's what I do. <laughs> and see, anyone who's ever been caught up in an addiction, and I'm sure some people listening to me right now have struggled, whether it's to alcohol or to sex or, or to the internet or whatever it is, that's what it's like, right? I mean, I know, I know the right thing to do, but I don't do it. I know the thing to avoid, but that's exactly what I do. And when you're caught in that, you know you can't will yourself out of it. And there's a very simple reason, by the way, because the will is the problem, right? If, if your mind is the problem and your will is the problem, you can't think and will your way out of it. You'll just kind of exacerbate the problem. So, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That's all of us. See, we're, we're all meant to, to uh, come to terms with our captivity, and that opens you to precisely a savior. You're quite right. And not just a teacher. Now, maybe young people interested in philosophy and theology, read Kierkegaard. That's Kierkegaard's point over and over again, is that he's not just a teacher. If he is, then he's like Socrates, you know? And Socrates will tell you some basic things and teach you some basic moves. And hey, you're doing great. You're on your own. You don't need me. But Jesus is not like Socrates there. He's a savior, not a teacher. And, and, you know, else that comes to my mind is the famous line from Chesterton, you know, where he says, the only dogma for which there is empirical evidence is the dogma of original sin. <laughs> and I think, I mean, watch the 11 o'clock news at night, or, or even better, watch what's going on inside of you. And you'll see the evidence, if you want, for what the church means by original sin. This deep level dysfunction that we can't solve on our own. 
And that is an enormously important door into Christianity. I think sometimes when we know we need a savior, we're still not quite sure how to recognize him or what he's going to ask of us. So Thomas is asking about the kind of two wings it can feel like of Catholic spirituality, a deep river of mercy, uh, but also a strenuous call and rigorous theology. You know, how do we kind of navigate these two different parts of our faith and how do we respond when it feels like they're in tension with each other? Yeah, good. Okay, that's that's helpful. Well, in a way, they're in a very uh, healthy tension with each other, and that's okay. Um, you know that God, and I love that that phrase, the deep river of mercy. There's right through the Bible, and that God is Chesed is the Old Testament word. I mean, tender mercy, and you see it embodied, of course, in Jesus, His unconditional love. But the love that's exhibited by God in the Bible is never a cheap grace, to use Bonhoeffer's term. Uh, It's a love that demands, a love that awakens a response. Um, So there's the moral demand. We don't simply just, you know, lie back and say, oh, I'm basking in the mercy of God. No, the mercy of God is um, harsh and dreadful, you know, as Dostoevsky would have it. And it leads ultimately to the cross because that means self-gift, you know. So I, I like that tension on the moral plane between kind of the acceptance of grace but then the great demand of grace. Uh, If I'm catching it right, the intellectual side too, the more rigorous kind of terrific. I'm with Josef Ratzinger that, you know, we're a a logos religion. The minute you say that the logos became flesh, um, logos, of course, there are are Jewish uh, antecedents there, but, but clearly John is calling upon the Greek tradition as well. The logos, the mind, the reason of God, which is apparent in the world and the intelligibility of creation, is what becomes flesh in Jesus. And so from the beginning, look at from from John and from Paul on, we have people who are uh, deeply engaged intellectually around the truth of Christianity. I'm with Newman, too, in saying that one of the signs of a properly evolving Christianity is that it theologizes so stubbornly. Uh, when the church begins saying, oh, don't worry about you know, the life of the mind, and oh, don't, don't fuss with all this intellectual stuff, that's a sign of corruption. And I'll say it frankly, that when I was coming of age, there was a lot of that. In the years just after the council, there was a sort of anti-intellectualism. <clears throat> that's a sign of corruption. That means the church is, is, is not evolving, it's devolving. So uh, they all belong together, don't they? The deep river of mercy, beautiful, and that's displayed on the cross. But it calls forth a response of love that is hyper-demanding, and it invites this powerful reflection on the Logos, you know, the the full intellectual engagement. I like that Catholicism, you know, the kind of all-in quality of Catholicism, the the all-of-the-above quality, uh, a mysticism, a spirituality, a, a deep moral demand, a rich intellectual heritage, all at the same time. As a convert, the, the both andness of Catholicism is sometimes overwhelming. Um, yeah. It really speaks to how much Jesus gives us more than we ask for or more than we think is reasonable yeah. to ask for. That's right. Uh, that's right. And got, in, in prayer, so often we ask for something like, oh, Lord, here's what I want, you know. But that's never all that interesting. It's always what Christ wants for us. And it's always the best, but it doesn't seem that way. Because he, he's, go back to original sin, he's always fighting against the, our tendency toward self-absorption or whatever it is. So, but what he's got held out for you is always better than whatever you're asking for. I've got some people submitting questions anonymously, which is an option if you'd rather not come on video to ask yourself, or if you suspect you've got a very bad connection and you'd like me to ask (laughs) for you. So I'm going to pull two questions here, uh, which are from students who are kind of worried about how to evangelize when they're speaking to people who don't see the demands of Catholicism as a gift. Uh, So I have a student who wants to know, how do you start evangelizing someone when the parts of Catholicism they may know about, the teachings on sexuality or Mm -hmm. divorce, don't feel inviting? Um, And especially from another student, you know, how do we defend Catholic beliefs such as the value of life from conception to natural death and the importance of the family in an environment where these are rejected and it's mainstream to reject them, as many students feel is the yeah. case on campus. Yeah, good. it's a good question, and it's one that we all wrestle with. Um, when I was over in Rome for the Youth Synod back in 2018, we talked a lot about these things. And 
the image from the scripture that kept coming back to us was the road to Emmaus. And the feature of Jesus at the beginning, simply joining two disciples as they walk the wrong way. So they're walking away from Jerusalem. And in Mark's gospel, or Luke's gospel, uh, that's always to walk the wrong way. Everything tends toward uh, Jerusalem. So they're symbolic in a way of a lot of people today who are walking away from uh, the faith, walking away from Christ. But the beautiful thing is he doesn't uh, judge them. He doesn't uh, come down to them, doesn't correct them. He, he simply walks with them. And, and what a lovely touch, of course, they don't recognize him. How often that's true today, too, that people don't know Jesus or he's become like an alien figure. But he walks with them, and what does he ask them? Well, what, what, what are you two talking about as you go on your way? <laughs> and so he didn't give a sermon at first. Is he listened to what they were talking about? What's on your mind? I think that's a very good evangelical uh, strategy. So you sit down with someone. You know, well, what are they talking about? What's on their mind? What are their questions? And the clever evangelist can find a hook in whatever that is. Whatever the, the interest is or the passion is, you can find some way to lead that person there by, to Christ. So I recommend that very strongly. Walk with them in a, in a listening sort of attitude. Find out what's on their mind. What are they listening to musically? What plays are they watching? What kind of friends do they have? What are their, their interests and passions? And then use that as your starting point. Um, I, I would tend to, to recommend don't begin with the church's sexual teaching, which for a lot of people is just a, a block, you know. I told the bishops um, uh, last year when I, I spoke to them on evangelizing the unaffiliated, I said, you know, I'd recommend beginning with the church's uh, justice tradition because a lot of young people especially, they love that. They're passionate about it, as I said. Okay, we got a really strong tradition coming up out of Isaiah and Hosea and, and, and Ezekiel and the great prophets coming up through Jesus himself into the church fathers, Thomas Aquinas, the Catholic Church social teaching tradition. We, we got a lot to say about that. Good, good. Start with that, maybe. Start with that part of the tradition that young people might find more agreeable. But I think, above all, listen to them. And, hey, what, what are you talking about as you go on your way? Excellent. Well, we have a number of questions about kind of addressing the challenges of the present day. Uh, but Elizabeth, who's joining us next, has a question about how to be prepared for challenges in the future. Let's see. Elizabeth, are you with us right now? All right, Elizabeth, I'm going to come back to you as our subsequent questioner once you're ready. Um, and I'm going to instead pass on a different question from an anonymous uh, attendee who wants to know, how do we approach evangelizing someone who isn't indifferent to the church or kind of just dismisses of the church, but has grown up in a faith tradition that actively rejects Catholicism as heresy or speaks of the Pope as antichrist? Well, I think there are two ways. They're, they're kind of in tension with each other. But one would be you are, you are bound to find some points of contact. So no matter what, if it's a Christian tradition, uh, there are lots of points of contact. You know, Jesus himself and the cross and the resurrection and um, the, the demands of the Christian ethical life, the importance of preaching. There's all sorts of things that we have in common. Uh, maybe start with those. But the, the other side, the other strategy, a bit in tension with it, is, okay, let's start with the top three questions you got or the top three reasons you don't like Catholicism. And I'm with Fulton Sheen there. I think most likely you're going to find there's some misunderstanding of what the Catholic position really is. So it could just be a moment of, of clarification. Like, well, let me. that's actually not what we believe. Here's what we believe. So I think either one of those can work. Uh, if the person's got a, even a modicum of goodwill, you know, they're not just hostile to you, say, okay, give me the top three. What are the top three reasons you don't like Catholicism? And let's start talking about that. Or, you know, from your side, even to say, hey, here are three things about your tradition that I think are really wonderful, and, and let me tell you why. So I think those both could work, depending on the person. I think it's a good place to start. And of course, once the conversation begins, it's harder to predict where it will go next, and we have to wait and consider the person in front of us. 
No, quite right. And everybody is different. And you've got to be kind of light on your feet. That's to say, you know, like a good tennis player has got to be able to move where the ball goes. And if you just have a forehand, well, the person will just keep <laughs> throwing to your backhand. So, I mean, you got to be kind of nimble and, and able to respond to situations. Um, and that's good. That's good practice, you know. One thing that helps me a lot is remembering that I can pause while evangelizing and say, I don't know the answer to that. You know, I'm going to go, in my case, check in with a Dominican friar and then come yeah. back to you because they're the nerds of the Catholic Church. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but knowing I don't need to be prepared for everything someone may ask me in Th the moment. That's right. No, that's right. And that's fair. You don't have to be like, I, I'm the answer man or the answer woman. I've got everything together. And, and also the very fact that your, your personality might be the most attractive thing to that person, that you're building up trust. If you're showing that, well, look, I'm, I'm a Catholic and I'm actually kind of a nice fellow and I'm not browbeating you and I'm, I'm not trying to be dismissive and disrespectful, okay, maybe that inspires in me a sense of trust. And that trust is, is indispensable. You know, that's why the internet world is so, it's lovely, it's wonderful, but it's also terrible. As I, someone who uses a lot, you know, I know this. And what I mean here is so often our exchanges on the internet, because they're disembodied, they're impersonal, just words appearing on a screen. That can be so dysfunctional because everyone just wants to win the argument, you know? Well, I mean, you can, as many have said, you can win the argument and totally lose the soul you're after. My job as an evangelist is not to win arguments. I mean, if I were on Jeopardy or something, but my, my goal is to win souls. And, and I can be the smartest guy on the internet and I can win the argument, but totally lose the person I'm talking to. So that's super important that all the time you're reaching out in, in love, you know. Well, there's something I really appreciate about the way you evangelize, Bishop, because you go into these kind of maelstroms of sometimes toxic <laughs> online places like Reddit and Twitter. Yeah. And it really takes swimming against the mainstream culture of those spaces to be a Christian, let alone evangelize. So I want to invite Miguel, uh, who has a question, to come in because his question is exactly about how we know when we're swimming against culture and when we're part of it. Mm -hmm. Bishop Barron, thank you Hi. so much for being with us. I'll You're be welcome. virtually on uh, these days. Uh, my question was, how do we discern when to be contrarian or when to be go against the grain in our modern culture? Because as you said, you know, we don't want to just win arguments. We want to do a lot more than win arguments. Mm -hmm. um, so that means in particular, with reference to culture, you know, what kind of music, when we learn what music is good, what good, how do we dress, what books to read. Uh, so learning to embrace the world, but also learning to, to know when to say no. And on a, on a second point related to that is, is how do we learn when's the appropriate time to speak up or to speak the truth? Yeah, good. And it's, there's no like quick, easy answer to that question. It's a, a matter of prudential discernment. The general principle, I go back again to John Henry Newman, is we go out to meet the culture the way an animal goes out into its environment. That's to say, uh, assimilating what we can from it, resisting what we must. Because if you don't do both those things, you'll be dead in very short order, right? If you don't assimilate anything from the environing culture, well, then you're, you're, you're dead. But if you, if you are simply resisting the, the culture completely, you'll also be dead. You know? So you go out in this kind of canny uh, style. And the church has always done that at its best. It, it's discerned from the church fathers on, like, like, what's valuable? What's worthwhile in this culture? Look at the Platonism of the church fathers. Look at all the Logos theologies um, that, are, that are arising from a dialogue with the uh, philosophy of the time. Maybe most famously Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century. Uh, Newman, the 19th century, dialoguing with uh, Locke and Hume and many others. Um, good, good. At the same time, the church has to resist. If there's something in the culture that's inimical to its form of life, um, and that's been true too, and that's why we have martyrs, you know, from the very beginning. Uh, at every age, the, the great saints have resisted. Look at a Thomas More, you know, who Talk about someone that knew how to assimilate the culture and to move creatively with it, even rising to a very high point in it. But then he also realized, no, no, but th th what, what the king is asking me to do now, I, I cannot do. And then so resisted it to the point of death. 
So I'm speaking more generically there to your point that you're, you're doing both. What's the sign? Well, what's inimical to truth and to love has to be resisted. So there's something in the culture that's moving you away from love and is moving you toward self-protection, isolation, um, separation in, in the bad sense, alienation from others. Uh, that's something that needs to be uh, resisted. What's leading you away from truth, and I, I don't say that in sort of a, a, a glib or trivial way, God is the truth, which means God is, is most fully real. What, what's false, what's unreal, what's not the case, that's always inimical to God and the things of God. And you well know all cultures, including our own, are often predicated upon lies and distortions and uh, half-truths and so on. Well, the church has to resist those and, and call them out. So that's a, a broad way of talking about it. Both truth and love are criteria. Um, in your, now bring it all the way down like to your dealings with friends. Well, keep those principles in mind. You're, you're always that foraging animal, you know, assimilating and resisting. You're sensitive to both truth and love all the time. Does that mean that any time you sense an untruth, you say it? No, not necessarily, because that could end up violating the principle of love, right? Hey, you're wrong about that. Let me tell you why. Again, there's the internet, right? Is you're truthful, but you're violating the principle of love. Now, turn that around. You can also love in a way that violates the principle of truth. Oh, I just love everybody. I make no judgments, and I never say anything's wrong. That's not right either. So you're moving, I'd say, there in between truth and love all the time, and you're making your way as that, that canny animal makes his way. So I don't know if that helps. I'm kind of just trying to put some parameters around your question from the most general to the most specific. Um, but that's what you have to do. But there's no clear-cut answer because you've got to discern that prudentially in the particular case. I think that really speaks to the importance of having a well-formed conscience and knowing that yeah. that's a project of our whole lives, you know, not something we can just take for granted. Our next question yeah. is from Kyle, which is really a lot about how we get that kind of formation um, and are ready, like St. Thomas More was, to do what's called of us in hard times. Kyle? Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Your Excellency. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, um, who are some of your biggest role models and influences, both when you were entering college and as you were um, about to leave college. And if you have any suggestions for thinkers or lives of the saints um, to read while we're in these different stages of our life. Yeah, good. When I was in high school, it was Thomas Aquinas made the biggest difference in my life. Um, I heard one of the arguments for God's existence when I was a kid. I was 14 in freshman high school. And even though I was a Catholic going to Mass, I, I wasn't really all that interested in religion. I was interested in baseball at that point in my life. But something about that experience of hearing that argument had a huge impact on me. And it led me down this path. And it's, it's really God's truth to say, I've never substantially left that path from the time I was 14 to my present age, which I won't tell you. But um, uh, Thomas, therefore, has been one of the touchstones for my life. And... Uh, done most of my academic work around Aquinas. Um, he's the one I've gone back to most often in my own writing. Uh, most of my work sort of ends up centering around him in some way. So Aquinas, you know, the, the patron for your institute there, is the most important figure for me. Uh, when I was a young man, too, Thomas Merton, he was not read as much anymore. I don't know if you even know that name, but Merton, who had been a... Um, kind of a, a whirlwind, to use an, an old-fashioned term, a, a man of the world. He was a master's degree from Columbia in English literature. He wanted to be a, a novelist like Hemingway. He had traveled the world. He was, he was kind of a, a you know, very secularized figure. And then he, um, through a long, interesting process, becomes a Catholic and then eventually a Trappist monk, one of the most intense expressions of the monastic life. I read his, his uh, autobiography called The Seven Story Mountain when I was about 16, and it had a huge impact on me. I'm not a Trappist, as you can well see, but Merton made more viscerally real to me what I was reading about abstractly in Aquinas. You know what I'm saying? Is the ideas in Aquinas became very vividly real in this American story. So he's an you know, older generation 
than mine, certainly, but an American um, young man falling in love with God. And um, I, I can still vividly remember reading that book for the first time. I've reread it, I don't know, 10, 12 times since then. So those two figures, Thomas Aquinas from the 13th century, Thomas Merton from the 20th, were two big um, influences. Another one, you know, it's because I, I saw Man for All Seasons when I was probably around that same age for the first time. Uh, Thomas More was a touchstone figure for me. Um, you know, someone who lived with that kind of integrity and uh, didn't run to the uh, scaffold. You know, I mean, someone who, who made his way very cagely within the world and, and made it to the highest levels of the society of his time, but never abandoned his great religious principles. And when, when push came to shove, he said, no, I'm, I'm going to stand with them. That to me, and he's a layman, uh, a great model, I think, for people who are Catholic and also want to move in the world. So those figures were uh, important to me uh, when I was a young man, like around you know your age. I think it's amazing the role that memoir and even fiction can play in helping us picture not only Catholic theology, but how it's applied in a Catholic life. That yeah. reading Merton's autobiography gives us a sense of what it means to live the faith at the individual level. Mm -hmm. A Man for All Seasons meant a lot to me in understanding it, who yeah. the martyrs were. Yeah. So I'll confess that the first time I read the play was with a group of strangers who, when I came in, picked me immediately to read Cromwell, and I felt that... terrible. <laughs> You're the bad guy. Because <laughs> he's the villain. Yeah. But our next, our next question is from Juliana, who has really a question about when we're called to be those models, just like those memoirs and you know, fictional portrayals of the saints are. Hi, Bishop Barron. Thank you Hi. so much for um, speaking to us today. Um, my question is, um, do you suggest that um, we lead more by action and wait for others to ask about our faith? Or um, should we actively um, talk about our faith to those that we want to um, evangelize? Like, how do we take that first step? It depends. Um, it depends on the person. And you can read the situation on the ground much better than I ever could, you know, from a distance. Because it, it depends. Uh, like when I was a kid, again, it wasn't quite being evangelized. I was already evangelized. But like what awakened me was this, this abstract philosophical argument. I don't know why. I, I mean, I was a smart enough kid, I suppose, in school. But, but I wasn't really in a, a bookish type. I was a baseball player. But something sang to me in that argument. And so I'm always resistant to people say, oh, oh, you know, arguments and all that, that don't use those and oh, no, no. They... It worked in my case. I don't know if you know the name William Lane Craig, the um, evangelical philosopher who has debated the great atheist very uh, effectively. I had an interesting conversation with him a couple years ago, and he said the same thing, that when he was a young man, it was arguments for God's existence that really woke him up and that he too felt a resistance to those who say, oh, you know, oh, don't, don't, don't talk about academic things. Because it depends on the person, you know. Now, in other cases, not at all. <laughs> in other cases, people wouldn't respond at all to that approach. And it's much more, as you say, your, your lifestyle, your witness, uh, the, the way you live your life, that can have a huge impact. I'll tell you a story I've always loved. Uh, there was a, a man that I taught when I was a professor at Mundelein Seminary outside Chicago. And he was an older vocation. He came to us like when he was in his late 40s or early 50s even. And he had a successful career. And, uh, but at midlife, I think he was, he was divorced and he was kind of drifting and had sort of lost his way. He had plenty of money and all that success in the worldly sense, but he was just kind of drifting. But one day he's walking past the entrance to Holy Name Cathedral, which is right in downtown Chicago, the big Catholic cathedral. And out in front after Mass was this little priest, I knew him very well, he's died since, named Bobby McLaughlin, Father McLaughlin, who was the pastor. And he was this little Irish sort of uh, fireball, you know, just full of joy and life and humor and jokes and, and depth as well. He was a smart man. Well, anyway, this, this man is walking by he hadn't been in a church for years. I think he was born and raised Catholic, but he had left a long time ago. And he sees Father McLaughlin. And he walked up to him, didn't know him from Adam, walked up and he said, what you got, I want. And Father McLaughlin said, okay, let's have coffee. 
And so later that week, they sat down and had coffee, and that was the beginning of his journey that led him to the seminary and eventually to the priesthood. Now, I tell that perhaps tiresome story just to illustrate it wasn't arguments, it wasn't answering questions. It was he just saw something in in Father McLaughlin that he thought was so compelling and so alive, and he said, I want that, you know. So that can be very effective evangelization. Um, the evangelist has got to have a lot of uh, tricks in the bag. You know what I mean? You got, you got to be able to do a lot of different things depending on the person you're dealing with. Um, but I think to your point, the, the witness of your life can be a number one. I think the secret trick is that the first step of being a good evangelist is being a saint. Yeah. And then everything else is more to get you to that point. Right. But right. there's there such an the attractiveness best theologians, to the saints. too, as Baltazar said, the best knowers of the faith are the ones who practice it most clearly. Uh, we next have a question from Katie, who has a question about... Um, how evangelization is different from other kinds of conflicts or arguments we might be in. Okay. Go ahead, Katie. Hi, Bishop Barron. Hi. Uh, um, so I was listening to your uh, Word on Fire podcast with Brandon Vaught recently oh, yeah. about the Creating Atheist book. Yeah. Um, and first of all, I really appreciated your rants about it. It just validated <laughs> everything that Good. I was feeling. <laughs> Good. Um, but I was, I, both of you made a point that there was something very manipulative about his approach. And the question that came to mind for me was how is that approach different from what evangelization, like true evangelization is trying to do? How is it different? Yeah. And to be fair, you know, I, I am no great student of that street evangel or street epistemology. Brandon sort of brought me into that book and we talked about it, but I wouldn't claim to have a great, you know, grasp of it. But I would say that in the measure that you ever become manipulative, you're now a bad evangelist. <laughs> you know, if you're trying to coerce people or trick them or manipulate them or play mind games, then you're not evangelizing effectively, just by definition. Now, it doesn't mean you can't intellectualize and you can't declare what you think is true. But by definition, a manipulative evangelization is what the Pope often calls proselytizing. Um, it's a, it's a word that's not used it often, but he uses it a lot. And I think all he means by it is bad evangelization, evangelizing in a sort of browbeating or, as you say, manipulative uh, way that's not respecting the person at all. Uh, I think, again, witness with your life and lead with the questions that people have. What, what are you talking about as you go on your way? Think Jesus and the road to Emmaus. What, what are you talking about? What's on your mind? Tell me. You know, I'm curious. And... Um, Whatever you tell me will lead to Christ. That, that's a basic intuition of any evangelist. Even if you say, I, I, hey, what I'm talking about is how miserable my life is. Watch every single Billy Graham sermon. Basically has the structure of, your life is kind of miserable, isn't it? Well, and you've tried this and this and this and this and that. Well, I got the one thing that'll work. So, you know, if someone's talking about their own misery, that's, that's a way into the gospel. Someone's talking about uh, their career aspirations. That's, that's a way in. Someone's talking about sports, you know, or something beautiful. That's a way in. So I think that's the, that's the overall method is um, listen, walk with them. Um, but the minute you become manipulative, you're, you're ipso facto a bad evangelizer. <laughs> I, I think that's a great distinction to draw. And one of the things that really stands out, what's different about speaking the truth about Christianity versus being a spin doctor or just trying yeah. to win, um, is that right. evangelists are actually in a much more dependent position of radical trust, of saying, tell me about yourself. I trust that something in that leads to Christ because I know he made you, rather right. than I have all the answers at the start of this conversation and I have control over it the whole time. Yeah, no, quite right. But it's just a little scary leaving that much room for the Holy Spirit when you're talking about something important. No, and you're right. And that's why the internet, too, it's easier space. I'm sitting on the, you know, my computer uh, keyboard, and I can rattle off some argument. I can't see the person's face. I can't see their reaction. I don't know anything about their life. And that's why that can lead to proselytizing in the bad way. But when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody, and you see how they're reacting and, and their body language, and you hear about their life, well, you're not going to be offering little glib, you know, responses. 
I do have a follow-up question then, Please. just when you are on the internet and you don't have that kind of access and you feel less like you're talking to someone mm -hmm. person to person, how do you know when it's worth it to engage or are there anything you can do to be better able to recognize that person's full dignity as a child of God, even when they're just, you know, a little avatar that's not even their real face. Right. And I wrestle all the time with that. I've been doing it for now for 20 years and I, I still wrestle with it a lot. One little trick I do is, I guess it's right to call it a trick, is um, I always address someone as friend, friend, comma. And it's just a signal to me really more than to the person like, okay, I'm trying to signal that I, I know you're a person. You're not just words on the screen. Um, it, it's, it's trying to signal to me, and I hope to the other person that, that I, what I want is a, some kind of personal you know, contact. I think maybe it's easier to know when it's gone bad. You can tell when, okay, this conversation is now dysfunctional because we're basically yelling at each other or we're basically trying to one-up each other. Uh, it, I think it becomes very clear, and it's it's marvelous, isn't it, when you can sense, no, this person really wants to know. This person really is curious, and they're, they're, they've been interested in something you said, and they want to know more. Or they've got an honest question. There's all of that, which is great. And then there's the other side, which, again, mea culpa, we all fall into it, which is, I'm here trying to win an argument. I'm trying to show you how smart I am. And by the way, you really hurt my feelings with that last comment. And so I, when it reaches that point, it's like, all right, all right, stop. <laughs> you know, it's probably better at this point to stop. Like, yeah, I'll tell you something again under the rubric of mea culpa that I've done is if you go back, I don't do it a lot, but if you go back to, let's say, a video from years ago and you look at an exchange that, let's say, that I've had with somebody and I might have thought like, oh, boy, that was really good. That was really clever. Boy, I really won that one. And then you read it and you think, oh, my gosh, I sound so patronizing or I sound so condescending or so Mr. Know-it-all, you know. Well, I, I always take those as kind of the, the Holy Spirit reminding me of like, okay, you know, you're not as clever as you think you are, and, and this is not a forum for showing off. So that's a good thing for anyone involved in the internet side of it to be aware of, I think. Yeah, you know, I, I feel like the real challenge is to do these things for God and not yeah. for us. Um, and right. Paul, I think you have a question that's really about how we carry that over um, to all parts of our life. Are you with us to ask it? Hi. Hi. Yeah, I'm right here. Uh, hello, Bishop Barron. Great Hi. to be able to speak with you today. Yeah, um, so I had a question about specifically St. Jose Maria Escriva talks a lot about um, this idea of unity of life, about orienting kind of all of your life in every aspect toward God, and mm -hmm. specifically um, the ways that sanctification of work um, can kind of act in that, in that regard. Yeah. And I was just wondering specifically for, for me and for other students listening, how you could give us some advice about how to sanctify our work and then just in general, how to specifically in, in the student life to really orient everything toward God. Yeah, it's good. It's a great principle uh, from Escriva. And I, I've called it, you know, finding the center. And I get that from Merton too and lots of the mystical people that, God has to be the, the organizing principle of your life. And, and I've used the rose window a lot as the image for that. If, if Christ is the center, then the rest of your life is organized in these kind of beautiful harmonic patterns around that center. So all the elements of the rose are the different aspects of you, inside and outside, the things you do, the, your relationships, your uh, entertainment life, your private life, your public life, that all of it is meant to be centered finally on Christ. Does, does everything belong to him? Well, it's a good point of, um, of examination of conscience. And maybe use that rose window image. So think of your life, you know, all its aspects, everything I just went through and everything else. All your friendships, do they, do they belong to him? Are they under the aegis of his love? Are they leading you to a deeper rapport with him? What you're reading, is it serving that purpose? Your entertainment. Would you be comfortable if Jesus were sitting right next to you when you're seeking whatever entertainment you're seeking? Your friendships, would you be comfortable inviting him around that same table with you, you know? Um, so your work, 
Okay, I don't know what your work is. Your work now as a student, I suppose. Um, is it ordered to his love and to his truth? Uh, is it serving his purposes ultimately? Let's say you're studying, I don't know what you're studying, but you know, business. Okay, fine. Uh, you know, money making and whatever your business interest is, but is all that directed finally to his purposes? I've had the privilege of knowing some, some marvelous business leaders in my life who are deeply Christian, have made lots of money and have found a way to, to devote it to the church in beautiful ways. Good. Whatever your work is, does it belong to him? So do the rose window exercise. Is this, think of, of maybe get a, on, your, on your computer, get an image of like the North Rose at Notre Dame, one of these beautiful roses. And then as you look at each medallion in it, just think of a different part of your life. Um, what's not nailed down? And now we're all sinners. We talk about original sin. That original sin is a, is a it, it's uh, destroying the harmony of that window and making it kind of a mess and a cacophony, right? Um, what's not nailed down in your life? What doesn't belong to him completely? Remember C.S. Lewis's image, I think it's Lewis, about the house. I've always liked that as, you get the house, with all the rooms in the house. Um, and Christ, oh yeah, yeah, you know, once a week he comes into the parlor and we sit down and we visit. And then I'm glad that he leaves, you know, because I want the whole house to myself. And the point is, like Jesus to Zacchaeus, you know, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. I'm moving in. And I'm moving into every room, <laughs> right? Well, that's making him the Lord Jesus Christ. He, Dominus, right? He's meant to dominate the whole of your life. Well, does he? And we're all sinners, so the answer is no to some degree for all of us. But that's the goal. Is invite him into every room in your house. Make sure everything in the rose window is linked to him. It's a very intimidating uh a part of prayer, I think, because there's always yeah. that moment where it's easy to ask for God's will to be done in our life until we look at the lives of the saints and think, yep. oh, but, but please not as it was, you know, in St. Catherine of Siena's life, her life was very intimidating, yeah. you know, yeah. that how do we, how do we have the courage to ask for the full measure of what God wants for us? That's the whole point of the exercises of Ignatius, isn't it, is to reach that point. And having done the exercises a couple times, the eight-day retreat, you, there's a moment that you're meant to come to where you make that move. And I found it exceptionally hard both times. Namely, that even the things that I, I am most afraid of, Lord, give those to me if it's your will, right? Uh, to come to that point and be able to say it is, is spectacularly difficult. Because you know? uh, that really makes it pointed. Is okay, what am I most afraid of? All right, one, two, three. Lord, give those to me if it's your will for me. Um, that's radical stuff. That's where the saints live. And, uh, you know, good. It's like, well, there's Michael Jordan and Tiger Woods, and we see these, you know, tremendous examples of this perfection. Well, the saints are like that in the spiritual order. Um, and you pray <laughs> that you might move into that space. I think the litany of humility is one of those, you know, scary but good prayers also yeah. for the full measure of what we want from God, yeah. Yeah, wanting yeah. what he wants for us. <laughs> We're nearing the end of our time, so I'm going to Are do we? a little housekeeping oh. and then give you one last question. Okay, I went fast. Now, Bishop, for one final question, sure. you know, I want to ask, for the Princeton students, uh, almost everyone is not on campus this semester. Everyone's yeah. separated. Uh, the school felt it wasn't safe to bring people back. So. What is one way that people can work on the project of evangelization at a time when they're not even sure they're getting to see their friends in person? Well, you know what I would do during this time? Is don't worry so much about how do I reach out and make contact. That'll come. I mean, please, God, this thing will be over, I hope, relatively soon. What I would do is cultivate your own spiritual life. Um, I've tried to see this time as a, as a gift, and it has been for me in many ways. It's been an odd sort of blessing. But to all of you, um, do a holy hour every day, or if, if you can't handle that, a holy half hour. Um, spend time. I don't know if you have the blessed sacrament on uh, 
Is it reserved there, Leah, where you are, or where is it? We we have it reserved in the chapel, but we're not allowed into the chapel. Oh, right. So okay. Okay. happily, the local parish has been allowing us to hold mass and adoration oh, good. there. Well, yeah. So go where, there or wherever you find the Blessed Sacrament and spend that half hour, that hour in prayer. Um, the time will come when you reach out again directly. But I think take advantage of this time of um, deeper interiority. I'll mention Thomas Merton again. Someone asked him, what's the best thing I can do to improve my prayer life? And he said, take the time. <laughs> it's simple and good and true, it seems to me. So take the time to um, be with the Lord and pray and study and cultivate your relationship with him in the silence of this time. And then it's like a, the seed will burst forth, you know, in time. But... Um, Take advantage of this uh, odd moment that nobody, you know, seven months ago was expecting and uh, see what the Lord is, is um, um, calling you to do. But I say deepen your prayer life. Thank you so much for that and for joining us tonight. Oh, my pleasure. You, Thank you. Would you lead us in a final prayer and blessing? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Gracious Lord, giver of all good things, we thank you for this time together. Lord, fill everybody who's part of this call with the spirit of, uh, of evangelization. Fill us with the spirit of your Son that will lead us out to the world with his challenging and uh, at times taunting and uplifting word. Father, give us grace and give us courage and give us prudence in the work that we do. I make all these prayers in Jesus' name, he who is Lord forever and ever. And the Lord be with you. With your spirit. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down upon all of you and remain with you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much one more time for joining us. <laughs> You're welcome. And you know, I really hope that we see just an incredible harvest uh, at the end of this period from the way we've all been scattered to do yeah. work we didn't know we were called to. Amen. Thanks, Leah. Thank you. And thank you, all of our attendees, yeah. for joining us. God bless you all. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed that video, I encourage you to share it and be sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel.